Well, welcome to Miss Rita's reading time again. We're going to have to go back and read in Magic Elizabeth some more. We need to finish that book. That's, I've got a whole bag of books to read. Oh, not the fairy doll. That's not it. Oh, the borrowers. That's not it. Oh, the tattered quilt. That's not it. Mmm. Sandra Dallas, the quilt walk. That's not it. Uh, Sandra Dallas, the Persian Pickle Club. That's not it. Uh, Mrs. Piggle Wiggle's Farm. That's not it. Oh, Beyond the Storm. That's not it. Up oh, there it is. We got a whole stack of books we got to read. And we can only read for a few minutes a day because it takes time. It takes, it takes time and I've got to cook and sew and do all kinds of farm chores. And we're going to start on page 116 today. This one's called A Decision. And where we left off, uh, Sally's mother was calling her. And she was going to talk to her mother on the phone. While she Remember, she was she's staying with uh, Aunt Sarah. And her mother's calling Sally. Well, here we go. Sally's hand was trembling as she picked up the telephone receiver. Hello, Mama, she said, and from somewhere far away came a voice which scare scarcely sounded like her mother at all. Sal, said the voice, oh, it's good to hear you. Are you all right, darling? Aunt Sarah says you have a little cold. Yes, said Sally, I'm all right. Shadow had jumped up onto the telephone table and was watching her, his tail hanging off the table, the tip of it twitching back and forth. Aunt Sarah was standing somewhere nearby behind Sally. You sound a little hoarse, Sal. Are you sure you're all right? Sally cleared her throat. I'm all right, she said. I just ran in from the barn. Hi, Dad, she said. It's good to talk to you. Want your mom to come and get you, old girl, he asked. Yes, Sal said her mother before she could but before she could answer, I've really had enough son, and your father can handle his business without me. What do you say, dear? When I gave Mrs. Chipley Aunt Sarah's address, I hardly expected Aunt Sarah says she'd like to have you stay, but it's up to you she She does asked Sally, yes, hon, that's what she said, but and her mother lowered her voice. I know that she's very old, dear, not used to children. And maybe you feel strange there. And I do miss you. I miss you too, said Sally. And then to her surprise, she heard herself say, say But I'd like to stay here. I really would. Aunt Sarah gave a little cough and cleared her throat. Are you sure, Sal? asked her mother. Very sure. Yes, I'm sure. I, I like it here. I'm looking for a doll. A doll? Yes, an old doll. Is Sally talking to her mother on the phone and Aunt Sarah watching her and Shadow on the telephone table? And there's the, the angel on the staircase. I don't know if we've seen that picture before. Right, let's keep reading. Yes, an old doll. She was lost here a long time ago, and maybe I can find her. I want to try. Well, my goodness, you do sound as if you're enjoying yourself. Are you sh very sure, Sal? Sal, said her father, we talked with Mrs. Chipley, and she may not be able to get back before we do. Though her daughter's getting along fine, we'll be back sometime before school starts. But Mom's ready to leave now, if you say the word. No, I really want to stay, said Sally. Honestly, I do want to. For how could she go with the mystery still unsolved? Shadow's licking my hand, she said, laughing. It tickles. No, it scrapes just like sandpaper. He's this black cat that Aunt Sarah has. There used to be another black cat here named Mrs. Nemony Pimony. Isn't that a funny name? And there's an old red sleigh in the barn. And there was a girl who lived here a long time ago. And she looked just like me. And her picture is hanging over a little green fireplace in my room. And I found a friend. Her name's Emily. Her mother was laughing. Goodness, she said, it sounds quite exciting. I guess you really do want to stay. Very well then, dear. But I'll give you our phone number here. And you can call me the minute you change your mind. 
All right, said Sally, but I don't think I will. She picked up a pencil, pushing Shadow off the pad of paper on the table and wrote down the number her mother gave her. Goodbye, Sal, said her mother. Watch that cold. Goodbye, Pumpkin, said her father. She hung up and turned to Aunt Sarah. To her immense surprise, Aunt Sarah was smiling. And in a way that lit up her eyes so that she looked even more like the other Sally's mother, through her, though her hair was indeed very gray. Sally smiled shyly back at her. But at this, Aunt Sarah turned her head to look at Shadow, cleared her throat, and said, Well, Shadow's looking very happy that you're staying. And so am I, thought Sally, catching a glimpse of herself in the mirror on the wall over the telephone. She gave a little skip that clearly expressed her pleasure as she followed Aunt Sarah from the hall. She hurried back out to the garden and into the barn. Emily, she called before she had even gotten through the doors. I'm staying. We can do all sorts of things. But the sleigh was quite empty. Emily, she called. Her friend had vanished. As Sally stood there forlornly looking up at the sleigh, a cloud passed over the sun, and the ribbons of light were abruptly withdrawn. Why did you go, Emily, she whispered. Ain't Sarah scared you away? She went back into the garden and called. She stood beneath Emily's window and called, but there was no answer. The shade had been drawn down over the window again. Just as if she had been a little garden spirit, Emily had disappeared. Somehow it didn't seem so good to be staying here after all. Maybe she should have asked her mother to come. Maybe she should call her back. But, but there was still Elizabeth. Yes, I want to find Elizabeth, she told herself, and I will somehow. And on to another chapter, A Somewhat Festive Meal. Dinner that evening was a rather festive occasion, eaten at the big round dining room table with a lace placemat for each of them. A celebration, said Aunt Sarah, as she lit the tall white candles she had placed on the table. What are we celebrating, asked Sally, who was still feeling unhappy about Emily. Perhaps we're celebrating your visit here, said Aunt Sarah. We haven't really done it properly yet, you know. I think Shadow's very happy to have you in the house. He's never had a child around, you know. That's why he's so unfriendly at first, I suppose. I believe he's sorry. I think he feels it's a happier house with you here. Sally looked down at Shadow, who was sitting on the floor next to her chair, looking expectantly up at her. Poor Shadow, he looks hungry, she said. Her hand hovered over the meat upon her plate. May I, she asked, looking at her aunt through the wavering light of the candles. Oh, Sally, said her aunt sharply, we don't. But then Aunt Sarah stopped. Her face softened with a smile, and a smile started somewhere about her eyes, though it was hard to tell in the flickering light of the candles. I think you may, she said. I think Shadow would like that. Thank you, said Sally, and gave Shadow... A piece of her meat. He flicked a grateful look at her as he took it. How funny Aunt Sarah was always talking about Shadow and how he felt. Did she mean she was happy to have Sally here too? Sally looked across the table at her aunt through the through her eyelashes. Aunt Sarah was touching her napkin to her lips and looking quite stern again. No, she probably was just glad that Shadow was happy. That was all she had said after all. I wonder if it looked like this when the other Sally lived here, Sally said, watching the reflected candle flames dancing on the tabletop. I imagine it did, said Aunt Sarah. The other, let me, let me show you the picture. Sally and Aunt Sarah at the festive table and Shadow waiting for a bite of the meat. Sally did her homework at this very table, at least I suppose she did. Sally looked down at the table. She looked closer. Just faintly, she could see something that looked like letters pressed into the wood near the edge of the place mat, of the lace mat. Sally knew what this was. Someone sometime had done homework here and had forgotten to put something under the paper to protect the table. 
Just as Sally herself had quite often forgotten at home, she ran her fingers over the letters. Yes, it was just the merest whisper from the past, but the letters spelled Sally. She smiled. She felt very close to the other Sally, as if the years had gone by did not matter at all. Her aunt was standing up. She looked very tall. Her movement disturbed the candle flames, and they wavered and then grew taller for a moment. Lighting up Aunt Sarah's face from beneath and giving her a rather forbidding look. With the lurching of her stomach, Sally remembered how Aunt Sarah had looked like a witch to her at first. But she didn't anymore, she thought. She still looked stern, but not like a witch. All her old fears seemed to have vanished that afternoon in the garden. Yes, she guessed she was getting used to her. We're getting quite used to having you around, said Aunt Sally, as if she had read Sally's mind. She began to clear the table. Sally jumped to her feet to help her. It was rather fun, handling the old blue and white dishes and wondering if the other Sally had perhaps carried these very same dishes from this very table. They had chocolate cake and pink ice cream for dessert, and after they had done the dishes, Sally was looking so tired that her aunt suggested she go right off to bed. She did so gratefully. When she had gotten into bed, her aunt said, looking down at her, Well, good night, Sally, in her abrupt way, and left. My mother always kisses me good night, thought Sally, but she did not say it. She lay there in the dark, missing her mother and wondering at all the things that had happened that day. She had not dared to ask again about going to the attic, and she was not at all sure that Aunt Sarah would let her. Oh, I suppose she will, she whispered in the darkness. I hope she will. The faces of the other Sally and Elizabeth in the picture above the fireplace showed, showed in the moonlight more than the darker areas of the painting. Sally felt that the two of them were watching over her as she fell asleep. The next chapter is A Summer Garden. And we'll keep reading a little longer. It was a dreary morning she woke to. Rain was pouring down in earnest, drumming up on the roof, dripping from the treetops and gurgling in the gutters in a most depressing and dismal way. The entire house creaked as if it were a ship in a stormy sea. Sally wondered as she woke why she was feeling so unhappy. Then she remembered Emily. Emily had been scared away. Her only real friend in this whole place was gone forever. She sighed deeply and shifted her feet. Her th throat was hurting again. Shadow's head appeared suddenly over the humped up blankets. His ears were back and eyes were narrowed. He looked very cranky. Sorry, Shadow, she said wearily, but you've been sleeping on my feet all night and they're stiff. Shadow grumbled something and lowered his head, curled up again at her feet as if he had found it hard to face the day. And as for Elizabeth, thought Sally, what makes me think that after all these years I can find her? She lay there staring gloomily up at the picture of the other Sally, who seemed to be looking sad too, until Aunt Sarah called to her from the bottom of the stairs that breakfast was ready. Down in the kitchen, Aunt Sarah was standing at the stove, stirring an enormous kettle of what seemed to be porridge. Sally could hear the bubbles bursting as they rose to the top of the kettle. It seemed to her that there was not a sadder, grayer sound in the world than the sluggish bursting of porridge bubbles. I hate porridge, thought Sally, sitting down dispiritedly at the table and staring at it, out at the gray rain. Aunt Sarah's back was to her, and she was standing one hand pressed against her back in a bent-over position, just as she had been when Sally first saw her in the doorway in the rain. A long strand of hair had escaped from the bun at the back of her neck and was dangling over her shoulder. Sally looked at it and thought that she'd like to tuck it back where it belonged. Aunt Sarah groaned. Arthritis, she said, always bothers me when it rains. Getting old. I'm sorry, said Sally. Sorry, snapped Aunt Sarah, turning around to glare at her. Sorry doesn't set the table. She turned back to the stove and began to stir the porridge furiously. 
Sally, feeling hurt, got up and began to take dishes from the cupboard to set the table. She was feeling extremely sorry for herself. Even the merry, merry ticking of the little church clock could not raise her spirits. You can get some prune juice from the refrigerator and pour it out, said Aunt Sarah. Prune juice, thought Sally, if that wasn't just like this day. A prune juice and porridge day, exactly. They sat down and ate their dismal meal in silence. Sally decided that after breakfast she'd call her mother. Yes, that's what she would do. I'm sorry, Sally, said her aunt. Sally looked up in surprise to see Aunt Sarah was gazing anxiously at her. That's all right, Sally said, looking down at the grayish remains of her porridge floating sluggishly in the blue milk. Drip, drip, whispered the rain. Her aunt sighed. It's a dreary day, she said, starting staring bleakly out the window, and I got up feeling just miserable. I'm afraid I took it out on you. I felt awful, too, when I got up, Sally confessed, all sort of gray. Well, you're not as gray as I am at any rate, said Aunt Sarah, indicating her own hair. Sally looked uncertainly at her aunt, but when Aunt Sarah gave a surprising snort that was a sort of laugh, Sally began to smile, and then she laughed, too. That really was a queer, this really was a queer day, Sally thought. She never expected she'd be laughing with Aunt Sarah. They did the dishes together in better spirits. Why, well, Sally, I believe you've made my arthritis better already, said Aunt Sally. Then, then she said, how would you like to spend a rainy morning playing in the attic? Sally grinned at her aunt. Oh, could I, she cried. Run along, said her aunt, run along. And off Sally went to the attic with Shadow following after her. He seemed quite relieved by his breakfast, which he had eaten beneath the sink. This time she made a systematic search of the attic, first the trunk, but there was nothing there she hadn't seen before. Then she looked in the other trunks and in drawers and boxes. She turned up all sorts of finery, glittering beads and earrings, feather fans, old lace, ancient dresses with pearls or jet beads stitched into flower and butterfly patterns on their skirts. There were, besides a man's high silk hat, a black satin shawl with a lining of rainbow silk, old paper lace valentines, Christmas cards, yellowed letters tied into bundles with faded bits of ribbon, broken and battered Christmas tree ornaments, and a plush rabbit lacking one pink eye. At last she was so tired that she simply sat down wearily on the floor and closed her eyes. Shadow was playing his usual game of pushing things into the space between the roof and the floor. She could hear some of the smaller things, beads perhaps, or marbles, falling down through the walls of the house. That th The house must be stuffed with all sorts of things, she thought. Oh, Shadow, she sighed, what's the use? She opened her eyes and looked into the mirror in front of her. There was still a clear space on its dusty surface where she had rubbed it at it the day before. Hello, she said to her reflection. The lips of the girl in the mirror moved. Sally smoothed her skirt. The girl in the mirror smoothed hers. But I'm not wearing the blue dress, Sally said, for the girl in the mirror was. She was wearing the blue ruffled dress and the yellow bonnet. And as Sally watched, she reached down, picked up a pink parasol which lay close beside her in the grass. Grass, whispered Sally, opened it and lifted it over her head. As she did so, Sally felt the shadow cast by the parasol spread over her. Over her. She felt the cool, slender handle in her fingers. She reached out and touched the grass next to her. You can sit here under the parasol with me if you like. Patient, she said, and a very little girl in a pink pinafore who looked a little like Emily, except that she wore long corkscrew curls rather than braids, moved over and sat next to her. She clasped her, her, clasped her hands demurely, 
together and looked straight ahead. The air over the garden was perfectly still. The bright flowers stood as motionless as the seashells that lined the graveled paths winding about the garden. From time to time an apple tree sang with the voices of the birds hidden among its leaves. On a blanket near the two girls in the shade of an apple tree, Bub lay sleeping on his side, one fist held tight against a closed eye. Soft bubbling sounds were rising from his mouth. Mrs. Nemini Pimini's children, so much bigger now that they could not really be called kittens, were sleeping too, heads tucked into their curled paws. The gray one and the orange one were not far from Mrs. Nemini Pimini herself, who snoozed sedately beneath a gooseberry bush. But Tom was sleeping with his head and front paws in Elizabeth's lap, where she sat propped up against the trunk of an apple tree. For, of course, he was her cat and even slept curled up on her feet at night in the little canopy doll bed next to the fireplace in Sally's room. Sally sighed and blew at a strand of her hair that it had plastered itself over her eyes. She was wearing a number of starched and scratchy petticoats, and she wished that she could, didn't have to entertain this shy little girl and take care of Bub besides. But her mother had asked her please to do it, so here she was sitting in the garden feeling hot and uncomfortable and wondering what they could do. It seemed to Sally that all the coolness left in the world must be contained in the forest at the end of the garden. How she longed to be sitting in there on the mossy ground with Elizabeth beside her. She would sit here and do nothing but scoop up pine needles, let them run like rain through her fingers, and listen to the ticking of the forest. She wished that at least a little bit of the piney coolness would blow out of the forest and into the garden. Sally, the, the old Sally, and patience, and I see Elizabeth right there with the kitty cat Tom. And the other kittens, and there's little Bub. See little Bub up there? She looked at Elizabeth sitting beneath the tree, cool and unruffled, while Tom purred in her lap. Elizabeth smiled serenely back at her as if she understood everything in the world. Then make a breeze come, please, Elizabeth, she said aloud. Patience looked sideways at her without moving. A small yellow butterfly seemed to spring from Elizabeth's bonnet, though Sally knew that it must have arrived so swiftly that she had not seen it come. It sat on the brim of her bonnet, its, its tissue paper wings throbbing as if a breeze moved them. A fluttering bouquet of blue and yellow butterflies settled on a seashell near Elizabeth's feet. Now, as if the arrival of the butterflies had been a signal, a pink flower dipped its head. A ripple ran over a bed of nasturtiums. A delphinium swayed. The whole garden woke up. Apple trees shook birds from their branches. Wind whispered in the empty seashells. Sally felt the coolness of the breeze on her hand and then on her cheek, and she sighed with pleasure. Patience, who sat with her legs straight out in front of her, wiggled her toes. Look at the picture one more time before we turn the page. Okay. Patience, who, who sat with her legs straight out in front of her, wiggled her toes as if she liked it too. Now the lilac bushes enclosing the garden stirred, and beyond them, ripple after ripple ran over the surrounding fields. The blowing foxtails and grass seemed to be hurrying toward the distant hills. The heads, heads of the cats lifted from their paws. Their eyes blinked. Their ears perked up. They all, except for Mrs. Nemini Pimini, who watched them through slitted eyes, leaped up and began to chase butterflies. Tom watched as the last butterfly lifted away to the sky, his tail twitching in the grass. The wind was dying down now. Sally bobbed her head at Elizabeth. Thank you, Elizabeth, she said. The little doll small smiled serenely back at her. Patience spoke for the first time. Is she magic? she asked. Her eyes were very round. I don't know, said Sally. 
which was true. She lowered her parasol and smiled at Patience. Would you like to play tea party, she asked. Patience nodded her head once. She was staring at Elizabeth. Sally picked up the little white china teapot from the grass in front of her and poured sugar water into one of the tiny white cups. Thank you, Patience whispered in a teeny weeny voice as Sally handed the cup to her. The cup clinked against its saucer and there came an answering clink for clink from the back porch where the mothers of the two girls sat drinking real tea. The far-off murmur of their voices blended pleasantly with the drowsy buzzing of the garden. Oh, I've dropped it, cried Patience, jumping to her feet, for she had spilled the sugar water tea all over her pink pinafore. A stain was slowly spreading over her skirt as she stood there looking down at it in dismay. Her eyes filled with tears. Her lips began to tremble. Oh dear, thought Sally, feeling very sorry for the little girl. Don't cry, she begged. And I've broken the handle off the cup, the little girl sobbed, while tears slipped out around the edges of her eyes. She pointed to where the cup lay upon its side next to a large seashell, its handle quite shattered. A blue butterfly returned for a moment to settle on the cup. Its fluttering wings cast a blue light on the thin china. The blue stain spread like a teardrop. Oh, that's all right, said Sally with an effort, for she dearly loved the little tea set, and her heart felt quite as shattered as the handle. There are lots more, and my papa can surely fix it. Just then, Elizabeth fell over with a soft plop. Sally looked up. One of the doll's cotton hands, as she lay there, seemed to be pointing toward Tom, who was crouched, his ears flat against his head, the tip of his tail twitching. He looked just ready to spring upon a very tiny toad sitting beside the apple tree. It was hard to see the toad because its skin so perfectly blended with the crinkly bark of the tree. It was blinking rapidly, and its throat was bulging in and out and out and in. Scat, Tom, cried Sally, clapping her hands sharply. The cat jumped, gave her a baleful look, and slunk away into the gooseberry bushes. But the toad still sat there, looking quite frozen with fear. Look, Sally whispered, reaching up and taking Patience's freckled hand in her own and drawing her down next to her. Look at the toad. I think it's just going to hop. The toad, with one last convulsive mo- movement of its throat, jumped. Up, up it went, and down, right into Sally's cup of tea. Sally and Patience hugged each other, rocking with laughter. Bub woke up, blinked his eyes, and began to cr- to laugh too. Solly funny, he crowed, pointing a fat pink finger. Funny, funny, Solly. And that made them laugh even harder. Funny, funny, Solly. What's happening out there, called Sally's mother from the porch. They could see her face peering anxiously through the vines that grew up over the roof of the porch, forming a green curtain as they went. It's all right. Sally's all right. It's, it's all right, gasped Sally when she and Patience wiped their eyes and set up at last, last still weakly laughing. They saw that the toad had disappeared. All trace of the spilled sugar water had been absorbed by the thirsty dry ground. Bub was sucking his thumb and looking inquiringly at them with his clear round eyes, and Mrs. Nimini Pimini was composedly blinking her green eyes at them. Her children, except for Tom, who watched from the gooseberry bush, had all gone back to sleep. Please have some pumpkin pie, said Sally, offering patience the center of a daisy upon a little china plate. Thank you, said Patience, and pretended to nibble at it. Her eyes lowered. Then she began to grin again. The lashes fluttered up. A last giggle shook her body. Jumped right into the cup, she said. Yes, said Sally. Spill the whole thing. Funny Solly, said Bub, removing his thumb from his mouth and holding it over his head. He lay on his back, gazing up at it as if he found his thumb most remarkable. 
Sally picked Elizabeth up and straightened her bonnet. Elizabeth saved that toad's life, she said. Tom was just going, just going to get it when she fell over. It looked just as if, as if she was pointing at Tom to show me, and she kissed the little doll. Maybe she is magic, breathed Patience, looking with deep respect at Elizabeth. Maybe, said Sally, feeling very proud of her pretty doll. But Elizabeth just went on smiling her usual sunny smile. Tom came patting back and warily placed his head upon Elizabeth's lap. Naughty Tom, Sally scolded, but I guess you can't help it. You're just a cat, and Elizabeth, se Elizabeth seems to like you. She placed the little doll's hand on Tom's head, and Tom purred and closed his eyes. Sally and Patience spent the rest of the afternoon quite pleasantly. Sally showed her the store of pepper boxes made from the seed containers of poppy plants that she kept in a hollow in one of the apple trees, along with some acorn cups. They sprinkled the seeds over a stew of leaves and berries they mixed together and cooked in the sun and then fed to Elizabeth holding Bub's hands while he toddled along between them. They pushed through a gap in the lilac bushes and sat for a time in the field, hidden from sight by the blowing foxtails. They made daisy chains while they were sitting there. From daisies they gathered by armfuls. And they made a hat for Elizabeth from a castor bean leaf and tied it with dandelion stems. And then they made a dandelion stem curls and hung them on her ears and tucked them beneath Elizabeth's bonnet. When Bub begged them to do so, they placed some on his ears too. What a pretty girl you'd be, Bub, said Sally. Pretty girl, Bub crowed. Then, holding Bub's hand again and leaving Elizabeth behind in the garden with the cats, cats they even went into the cool-smelling woods. They surprised a rabbit who jumped across their path, scattering pine needles as it went. Its white tail flashed as it vanished into the green, green darkness beyond the sunny clearing in which they stood. When Bub began to cry with tiredness, they took him back to the garden, and rather tired themselves, flopped down on the grass and made hollyhock dolls with twigs for arms. They danced the dolls about by blowing on them to amuse Bub. Meantime, the shadows were growing longer, till at last they could scarcely see each other at all. The bright roses seemed to be floating on the soft darkness, the white ones shining like moons. Their sweetness spilled over into the garden. Sally yawned and stretched. Patient's eyes were drooping. Bub was crying again. The footsteps of the girls' mother crunched on the graveled path. Their long skirts whispered over the grass, ballooned over the seashells, and scattered little pieces of gravel. Time to go home, <coughs> said Patience's mother. Time to go in, said Sally's mother, and she picked up Bub and kissed his fat, warm neck. Please, may I light the gas plant first, begged Sally. Her mother sighed, all right. <clears throat> All right, she said, patting Bub's shoulder and then placing him on the ground once more. He gave a loud sniff and began to suck his thumb. Her mother reached into her pocket, took out a match, and bent to strike it on a stone. She handed the little torch to Sally. Sally took it and turned to the tall plant that grew at the edge of the path, its white flowers expect expectantly open. His pointed leaves upright and alert as cat's ears. All around her, Sally could feel the watching eyes gleaming in the dark. Bubs, patience, the cats, and perhaps from beneath a leaf someplace, the little hop toads. Gently, she touched the match to each bloom. Up leaped a tiny bluish flame till the entire plant trembled with its own light. Ooh, came the whispers from all sides. Ooh. Beneath the plant, a family of ladybugs of all sizes, some so tiny that they could scarcely be seen at all in the wavering light, scattered in all directions. And something else showed, too. Tom, cried Sally. Oh, for goodness sake, said her mother, laughing. That cat. For in the glow of the g gas plant, 
Tom's pointed face bloomed, bloomed from beneath a gooseberry bush. He had Elizabeth in his mouth. Her bonnet was all askew, her arms and legs were dangling, and her face, looking quite pathetically helpless, hung upside down. Put her down, Tom, Sally ordered, making a threatening dart at him. Tom flicked across green across green glance at Sally, dropped the doll, and began to nibble at his paws by way of cleaning them. Sally straightened Elizabeth's bonnet and adjusted her dress. Honestly, she said, I think he was going to hide her someplace. I think he really believes she belongs to, belongs to him. Naughty Tom. Tom blinked and mewed sleepily. The flames of the gas plant flickered out. Time to go in. Someone had lighted the lamps inside the house and the light streamed out on out through the porch vines into the garden. The white glimmer of the seashells led them along the path. Sally hugged Elizabeth, followed the others into the house. And that's the end of that chapter. The next one is gingerbread cookies. And you know, I've never heard of a gas plant that you light and it makes a flame. I'm going to have to look that up. Maybe we can both look that up and see what a gas plant really is. Because that's something new for me. Alright, that's enough that's enough for today. We're stopping on page 144. And next time we read, it'll be Gingerbread Cookies, page 145. Bye, y'all. We gotta find out what happens. How does Elizabeth get lost? And how did, where did she where did she get lost at? And how does Sally find her? Gotta keep reading. It's a mystery. Bye.